Good morning and uh, welcome to this month's edition of What's Your Plan? Uh, I'm, I guess, your host, Steve Lorberbaum. And so basically what we do, uh, and Patricia DeBrew helps us uh, monthly, uh, we offer an educational opportunity to talk about issues that impact seniors. And they range from medical issues to practical issues like where to get uh, a stair glider if you need something like that. So uh, this month, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Matthew Mintz with us and uh, he's a primary care physician. And so he, he's gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, CBD and some other things related to the world of medical marijuana. Uh, a little bit first about assisting hands. Uh, we are a home care company and we work with families all over Montgomery County, PG County and Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, helping people with a little extra help in their homes, whether they need a trip to the airport, which we're doing uh, next week. We're, we're taking a client to the airport, getting her on an airplane because she has dementia. She's flying to Chicago and she's meeting her sister on the other end to caring for folks with cognitive, physical, and chronic disabilities uh, in their homes, wherever home is at the moment. It could be a hospital, could be a hotel, could be a private residence. So that's what we do but on to the more important topic of Dr. Mintz. So Dr. Mintz, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your practice. Great, thank you, uh, Steve, and assisting hands for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Mintz. I'm an internal medicine and primary care physician in practice for just over 25 years. Uh, the first 20 of those were downtown at George Washington University where I was full-time faculty splitting my time between uh, seeing patients and teaching the medical students and residents. And then about five years ago, decided to start my own practice uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, closer to where I live to, to avoid that commute to downtown DC. So I have a concierge practice, a uh, very small practice. It's just myself and my assistant. And the bulk of what I do at that practice is your typical primary care stuff. So you know, physicals and high blood pressure and cholesterol and uh, immunizations and COVID vaccines and all of those things that you would expect a regular doctor to do. Uh, that's the majority of what I do, but uh, one of the things that we're gonna talk today is something else that I started to do uh, when I opened my practice. Uh, a few months after starting my practice, a medical marijuana dispensary moved into my medical building. And since my practice was brand new and things were a little slow, I decided to investigate. And I talked to the owners to find out about medical marijuana. And uh, it wasn't something that was on my radar screen, but since they were right downstairs and I wasn't too busy, I decided, you know, if, you know, let me, let's see what happens if I certify some of, some of these patients. And so I'll admit I was a little skeptical at first, um, you know, are pe people just coming to me for a legal excuse to get pot? But what I found out was primarily because uh, recreational marijuana is legal in DC. If people just want to get pot legally, they go downtown. Uh, the first few patients I saw were very sick, uh, you know, uh, stage four cancer, severe pain, severe side effects, a lot of patients with chronic pain, uh, and many of them seniors, actually. Um, and, uh, and so I started to certify these patients, and I saw the results. And I saw that the cannabis was actually a good option uh, and uh, decided that I would incorporate this into my practice. Um, the downside of medical marijuana is because it is federally illegal, we don't have the uh, research or the wealth of research that we need. And so there's not a lot of information out there. So I had to spend a lot of time doing my own research, taking uh, courses on my own uh, to find out. Uh, the first patients that, that I sent down to the dispensary, uh, I just certified the patients. And, um, and, and essentially they got their information from the folks at the dispensary. These are called bud tenders. Uh, and uh, they would tell the patients what to take. And to me, that just didn't sit right. Uh, it would be like diagnosing with someone with diabetes and then sending them to CVS and asking the pharmacist what to take for their diabetes. But at least the pharmacist has a PhD in pharmacology and is, has a license. The, these people, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's no licensing, uh, there, there's no clinical experience. And, and, I, and don't get me wrong, the, the, the folks at the dispensary can be very helpful and very knowledgeable about the products. And some of them have been doing this for 15, 20 years. You know, Maryland didn't reinvent the wheel. A lot of these patients come from California and Colorado. 
but you don't know who you're going to get. You could get the person that just started two weeks ago that used to work at Starbucks and thought it was cool to work at a dispensary. So I decided that I would really educate myself, learn about this, try to educate my patients to find out what the best regimen for them was. So in addition to certifying patients, I give patients specific regimens, tell them exactly what to take, how much to take, how to take it, where to get it, et cetera. And so I write that down for them. So it's not a prescription per se, but it's a recommendation. So in addition to the certifications, I give patients recommendations about what to take and how to take them. Okay, so let's step back a little bit uh, to, you know, so I'm a person with pain. Um, maybe my doctor uh, knows about uh, medical marijuana, maybe they don't. Um, what's the process? Does a doctor, first off, need to get certified to even write a script or can any doctor do it? And right, then so first, what's, the med what's the process that you have to go through with Maryland if, in a minute or two? I don't want to spend a lot of time no, on it. A very good question. So one clarification, it's not a prescription. Okay. So prescription is I write a prescription, you go to the CVS and they have to tell you exactly you know, whatever they can, the pharmacist can't change what I write down. They can substitute a generic, but they can't do anything more than that without calling me. So this is not a prescription. This is basically essentially what the provider is doing is certifying that the patient meets, meets the state's criteria for medical cannabis. And then they can take that certificate and go to a dispensary, a separately regulated uh, place that then sells them the product and they can get whatever they want. So, you know, again, this is the reason why I specifically give recommendations and don't rely on the folks at the dispensary. So to answer your question, so one, so there's, it's a two, it's a two pathway process. So the first thing you have to do is you have to register with the state. Unfortunately in Maryland, this is on, entirely online and this can be a big challenge for seniors because you have to, you, you have to have an email, you have to go online, you have to upload like pictures of the front and back of your driver's license. So it can be challenging you know, for people who are not tech savvy. Um, now, many of the dispensaries will actually help you with this process. They'll help you with the registration because they realize that this can be a challenge for anyone, not just seniors. But you have to register with the state, just like you would register for a driver's license or a fishing license or anything like that. So that's step one. Step two is you have to be certified by a certifying provider. So not every doctor can do this. That doctor has to be certified by the state that can certify patients. And it's not just a doctor. Uh, in the state of Maryland, it can be a doctor, a dentist, a podiatrist, or a nurse practitioner. And most of the certifying providers in the state are actually not MDs. They're, they're some of those other specialties. Uh, so most physicians actually are not registered to certify patients. In fact, a lot of the uh, patients that I certify come from my physician colleagues. So they, they recognize that cannabis may help their patient, they don't know about it. They're not, you know, certified to do it. So they, they send them to me. So, cause they at least know that I know what I'm doing and they trust me. Uh, so, so I actually get a lot of referrals from my, my doctor colleagues. So it's a two-step process. You have to register with the state. You have to see a certifying provider. That certifying provider evaluates you, uh, documents that you meet the state's criteria and then gives you that certificate. And again, that's all you need in order to get to a dispensary of which in most cases, the folks at the dispensary can guide you through the process. Where I differ a little bit is that I actually, again, give recommendations to, I give, I spend time with patients telling them exactly what to take, where to get it, how to take it, et cetera. Okay, so, you know, without getting too technical, um, you know, there's apparently, you know, from my readings, there's CBD, there's THC, and, and then there's the world of terpenes. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, people are going to hear those words. Some may know what they mean. Some may not. Can you give us like sort of the layman's view of, you know, what do these things do and, and what are you looking for if you go into a dispensary and you don't have your advice and guidance? Good. Excellent question. So one of the things that's interesting about mm -hmm. marijuana versus prescription medicine is that a prescription <laughs> medicine generally has one ingredient in it. And so, so synthetic THC, which is a cannabinoid, has been around for a long time, actually doesn't really work that well. So one of the things that's interesting about using a plant as a medicine is there's more than one ingredient. There's more than one medicine in that plant. So there's about 500 biologically active ingredients 
in, 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 in the cannabis plant. So the main thing that we're talking about is cannabinoids. So these are biologically active agents in the plant that affect the body. The two main ones are THC and CBD. THC is the thing that makes you high, the thing that makes you sleepy, but also very good for pain, very good for sleep, at low doses, very good for anxiety. CBD is another cannabinoid in the cannabis plant. Uh, doesn't make you high, doesn't make you sleepy, good for anxiety, not so much good for pain, but very good for inflammation. And in addition to those main cannabinoids, there's other cannabinoids that have other properties, CBG, CBN, et cetera. In addition to those cannabinoids, you also have what you said are terpenes. Terpenes are biologically active ingredients that give the, the plant its sort of flavor and its smell. And terpenes are in other plants. So a common terpene, for example, is limonene. Limonene is what gives lemons and oranges that citrusy smell. That limonene has some medicinal properties. So, so the, each, each cannabis plant has its various cannabinoids, CBD, THC, and terpenes, and there are a bunch of them, and they all work differently together to give the effect. And so each plant, there's different strains. So there's, it's not just one plant, there's hundreds of different strains that have a various different proportions of CBD and THC and different sort of terpenes. So different, so one strain of cannabis may be good for anxiety. Another strain of cannabis may be good for depression. So you have to, so it's, it's not just the CBD, it's not that it's just the THC, it's not just the terpenes, but it's that combination of all those ingredients in those specific proportions that can help you treat a specific ailment. Wow. So there's a lot to this plan. Way more than, uh, you know, back in the day, if you just got high by smoking a joint. Exactly. So, so let's talk a little bit about delivery methods. So, you know, there now there days there's the, you know, you can smoke it, you can vape it, you can ingest it with edibles, you have lotions, you have creams, you have tinctures. It, can you give us, what's the difference with all these things? Does it matter how you ingest it? It does. It actually matters a lot. So the first thing is that you don't have to smoke it. Smoking is not good for you. I never recommend that patients smoke. Uh, inhalation, though, can be very helpful. So the difference between all those methods that you mentioned is how quickly does it work and how long does it last? So at one end of the spectrum are edibles. They come in gummies and pills and capsules and things like that. They take about an hour to kick in, but they last like six to eight hours. On the other end of that spectrum are, are vapes. So another way to inhale cannabis without smoking is, is, is using vaporized cannabis. And so what's good about that is it works within minutes. Um, so you really, it's very easy to adjust the dose and you can get quick relief, but it only lasts like an hour or so. So you, so, you, know, you don't wanna have to be taking a medicine multiple times a day, so it depends. In the middle of that, are what tincture. Tinctures are liquids. They're, they come in drops and you drop them under your tongue. You sort of let a couple drops sit there under your tongue, let it absorb, and then you swallow the rest of it if there's any. There's someone in between. They, they take about 30 minutes to kick in and last about four to six hours. So that's primarily what I use. I use a combination of edibles, tinctures, vapes, and topicals. You also mentioned cre you know, creams, ointments. One of the great things about topicals is that they're not absorbed into the bloodstream. So they, they won't make you high, they won't make you sleepy, but especially for localized areas of pain, topicals can be wonderful because there's basically no side effects and they work very, very well. So those are the four different methods that I recommend. And I, I, the, how I recommend them sort of depends on what the patient's situation is. So if someone is having, for example, problems falling asleep, you might work with something that's a little quick acting like a vape or a tincture. If someone has problems staying asleep, you probably want something that lasts longer, like an edible. And in many situations, when patients have both, you could do both. You could do, a, you know, you could do a vape and an edible or something like that. So it really depends what the patient's symptoms are. But those are the different formulations that, that I use. Okay, so so smoking and vaping, I guess, are different in that vaping doesn't put smoke in your lungs. Is it is it also harmful for you? Or good question. You so? Great question. So basically, when you when you smoke something, whether it's nicotine, you know, tobacco leaves or cannabis leaves, you're getting the properties of that vaporized substance as well as the ash from the leaf. 
Okay, so that so even though there's nothing really harmful in cannabis, if you smoke it, you're inhaling that ash, which is not good for the lungs, not good for the heart. What what the, the what vaping is is that they take the leaf and they extract all the oils from that leaf and they put that concentrated oil in a cartridge and then they put that cartridge in a battery powered device. The battery heats the oil, so you're inhaling the vaporized oil. So you're basically getting all the good stuff, if you will, from the, the plant without the smoke part, without inhaling all of that carbon, all of that ash. Now, there's been a lot of bad you know, press, if you will, about vapes. And it's important to know that almost all of that has to do with nicotine vapes and not necessarily the nicotine, you know, the jewels that you can get from Walgreens, but mostly, you know, uh, vapes that are bought online, made in China, et cetera. The problem with those vapes are, you know, you know for example, Juul, you know, Juul, you know, there, there are some issues with it, but, but inhaling nicotine itself, vaping nicotine is actually not that harmful. It's the other stuff that's in the vape. So in the U.S. produced vapes, the stuff that's not good is the flavorings and the additives. In the illegal vapes, there's lots of chemicals and all other things. So for example, a couple of years ago, there was a huge outbreak uh, you know, where young kids wound up dead in the ICU because of a, a, an illegal vape product. And what they determined, the, uh, they investigated, they found out that that, that product, that component was a, a liquid vitamin E derivative. And so vitamin E might be good for taking via pill, but if you inhale it in your lungs, it's not very good. And so what's good about medical cannabis is it's highly regulated. So when you get that vape from a dispensary, not only do you know what's in it, what are the terpenes, what's the CBD, et cetera, but you know what's not in it. There's no additives, there's no flavorings, there's no fungi, you know, et cetera. So as long as you get a, a, a vape from a cannabis dispensary, a medical cannabis dispensary, very safe to use. A little bit different in DC where recreational cannabis is legal, I would not recommend using a cannabis vape that was purchased for, uh, you know, recreationally only because it's not regulated and I can't guarantee what's in that and what's not in that. But just inhaling plant oil from a medical cannabis vape should theoretically be very safe. Okay, so you lead me to another question. So obviously if somebody wants to get high or even you know, use it for a sleep aid, you could go to DC, you could sort of barter for it, whatever the rule is. Um, how does that marijuana differ other than the regulation part? Is there any difference between, you know, recreational marijuana and medical marijuana? Well, I mean, one of the main differences is the purpose of its use. So the purpose of medical marijuana is to, you know, as a medical condition, to treat a medical condition. The purpose of the medical marijuana is not to get high. Certainly, if you use enough of it, you certainly can. Most of the patients that I see, they don't want to get high. They want to you know, be able to go to sleep or be out of pain or not be so anxious, et cetera. But it's the same cannabinoids, terpenes, et cetera. Uh, the main difference is the regulation. So the, the medical marijuana is highly regulated. And because of that, I have confidence as a physician that the products are safe, that, that I know exactly what's in it. I know exactly what's not in it. And that's the problem with re recreational cannabis, because a lot of people come to me having used recreational cannabis medicinally, and they, they want it only because not only for legal reasons, but because they want the higher quality stuff. Because so with recreational cannabis, you don't know what you're getting. You know, they can tell you that, oh, this has a lot of this terpene, but you don't know that. You're just trusting them. I mean, it could be, you know, John's growing it in his backyard. You know, who knows what's in that or this, where is this vape coming from? Like, what is it? So that's one thing. The other thing is that the in the recreational space, at least locally, very different Colorado, California, but at least locally, you do not have nearly the variety of products that you have in a state like Maryland, where you have so many choices, almost too many choices between edibles and tinctures and vapes and things like that. The choices are very limited in the recreational space. And again, you don't exactly know what you're getting. You'll get a gummy, but you don't exactly know what's in it. You have to sort of trust, you know, whoever you get it for. So I generally do not recommend using recreational, you know, cannabis medicinally. It's better if you're going to use it as a medicine, you want to make sure that you know that it's safe and you know what the dose is and what's in it. So just like a regular medicine, just like you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't ask your next door neighbor to make you some Tylenol, you know, you, you would go to the CVS or Walgreens and get some and know that it's, you know, there's some regulation to that. So that's yeah. the big difference. So next question is uh, to me, a, a baffling one is, is 
dosing, right? So, you know, because, and maybe you do different, but you're the unusual doctor in this uh, as it relates to actually a doctor advising, you go to a place and then you say, all right, well, how much should I take? You know, you, you get a square, it's got 25 milligrams of THC or some sort of chocolate bar that has 100 milligrams of THC. How do you know whether you're take, you should be taking five milligrams, 10 milligrams? Is it trial and error or is there some science or guesstimate behind that that's useful? So the answer is both. So on the one hand, there is some science behind it, but the other thing is, is that everyone's very different. So, you know, people are, have different sensitivities to THC. So for example, I'll go back to Tylenol. You know, you know it doesn't matter if you go and if you take Tylenol, the dosing for Tylenol is the same, whether you're an 85 year old woman at 90 pounds or you're a 35 year old, you know, you know 400 pound male. Uh, the dosing's the same because there's a wide range. There's a there. there it's what's called a therapeutic window. It's a, a wide therapeutic window. Cannabis people are very sensitive to. Some people a tiny bit of cannabis is all they need. Other people they need a little bit more. So the way I recommend patients doing is what I call micro dosing, meaning you start at a very low dose that it's not likely to make you sleepy or high and may give you an effect. And then you slowly go up on that dose to try to find that perfect balance of the medicine, you know, achieving the effect that you want, you know, reducing anxiety, reducing pain without making you sleepy or high. And so I give patients specific instructions about not only what, you know, what, you know, what product to take, whether it's a tincture or, or a vape or whatever, you know, what strain to use, but also how to dose it. And again, essentially it's starting very low and slowly going up until you find that right dose. Okay. And do people build a tolerance or immunity? And over time, if they start with five, they may end up in, in six months or a year at 10? That's a very good question. So the answer is a little bit. So what's one of the things that, one of the things that the reasons that I like cannabis is because no, is because it's not very addictive. So it's slightly addictive. It's about as addictive as caffeine, but it's nowhere close to like the you know the um, benzodiazepines or the opioids or any of those medicines. It's not very addictive. It's less addictive than alcohol. Also, it's very safe. It won't kill you. No one's you get very sleepy, you can get very high, but you're not going to die from that. So that's one of the reasons why I think it is a really good option for a lot of patients, especially seniors, where you're really worried about side effects and, and things like that. So you can build up a tiny bit of tolerance over time, uh, but not that much, especially at the lower doses. And for people who do, who find that they're, they need slightly increased doses, one of the nice things about cannabis is, is if you take a holiday, if you stop using for a few days, your receptors sort of reset and you can go back to that sort of previous dose. So if you're using a ton of it over a long period of time, yes, you could gradually build tolerance and some people do. You generally not, but there, there, there can be a little bit which can be overcome. Do you have any recommendation for how to pick a dispensary? It seems like, you know, there's a new one popping up on a street corner virtually every month. Uh, how do you figure out which one's better than the other? Is there a way? That, that's a great question. Um, so part of it, part of it is location. So, uh, you know, my office is sort of North Bethesda, just south of Rockville. And the way uh, the, the, the dispensaries were, uh, uh, were regulated, in other words, where they're open, I happen to sit right on a congressional line. So I happen to have a lot of dispensaries, you know, with a stone's throw from my office. So I'm very lucky in that aspect. As you go further out from where my office, you know, you know, throughout the state of Maryland, it depends. So in, in some cases that I see patients, you know, from all over the state of Maryland, if they're out in places where, you know, there might only be like in Southern Maryland, there's a lot fewer dispensaries, you know, you may have fewer options. So one of it is, you know, you're, you're gonna wanna have some place that's relatively close to you. So location is a part of that, but assuming, you know, it's near my office, you know, I, what I look for is what are the, what are the, what are the, what are the products available? Do they have a lot of tinctures? Do they have a lot of edibles? Do they have a lot of vapes that patients from choose from, or they're very limited and, and the dispensary focuses mostly on um, just the, the cannabis or what's called flower. So is it that, or, you know, or, or, you know, so that's what I look for is, and, and then the knowledge and the knowledge of the dispensary, and I've worked with a lot of dispensaries. So over time I build up trust with some of the managers. And so I could recommend specific dispensaries, at least locally. Okay, would you, 
would it make sense to make a, a recommendation now or does it really depend on where you live because it really depends on where you live it really okay. depends on where you live we're very lucky in the bethesda rockville area to have a number of wonderful dispensaries gotcha okay and you know who regulates this it, it's it's obviously some state agency because federally it's not permitted that's correct so each state has its own way of regulating in the state of maryland it's the maryland medical cannabis commission so the state created legislation that created this commission that regulates the whole process so uh so if i have a, a medical card in maryland but i'm in you know some other place that has medical laws but not recreational can i use my card there or is it state specific it's in general 90 percent of the time it's state specific the only exception interestingly is dc dc has reciprocity with most states so your maryland card will work in dc but a dc card does not work in maryland so with the exception of dc to my knowledge it's 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 other, it's otherwise state specific so for example you know talking about seniors you know I've, i'd say more than half of my patients are seniors i have a lot of snowbirds I have a lot of patients that spend a lot of time in Florida where it is also medically uh, uh, legal. So they can't use their medical card to buy cannabis in Florida. So they have to figure out, do they need to get a separate Florida card or can they stock up in Maryland and, and bring it to Florida or vice versa? Okay. Uh, so there's a question in the chat uh, relative to Parkinson's. Are there parts or strands of medical marijuana that would help with tremors and handshakes? A quick answer, yes. Yes, so I've seen se several. It doesn't treat the Parkinson's itself, but can treat sort of the, the symptoms of Parkinson's tremor, which is one of them. So yes, it can help with tremor. Okay, so really marijuana and its associated components, it's not treating disease, it's managing symptoms. Is that um, fair to say or no? Fair to say with the current available evidence that we have. So I, I, I'm not trying to be confusing, but you know, we have limited data, you know, so I can tell you it's good for sleep, it's good for anxiety, it's good for pain, it's good for a variety of conditions. But there's some, bench, some basic research that's out there that suggests that it can do even more. A good example is cancer. So I, I think cannabis is a really good option for patients with cancer because it treats the symptoms of cancer. So for example, pain, you know, if people have metastases and it goes to the bone, that can be very painful. It also treats the side effects of some of the treatment. So chemotherapy can cause horrible nausea. And for a lot of patients, cannabis is the only thing. However, there's some very intriguing preliminary evidence that cannabis actually has anti-cancer properties. So cannabis may actually be treating cancer. My belief is that within five to 10 years, depending on when, uh, cannabis gets federally legal and we have the research that cannabis will actually be part of a cancer treatment regimen based on some of its anti-cancer properties. Now, this is all very preliminary. So that's why I'm hesitant to, I'm not telling patients stop your chemotherapy, take cannabis, but there are some interesting properties, not just in cancer, but in brain diseases. So again, the question was about Parkinson's. So I said, it doesn't treat Parkinson's. That may not be entirely true. Um, because it may have some anti, it may have some sort of uh, uh, what's called neuroprotective effects in brain cells, and it may be helpful. We just don't have the research yet because we don't. It's not federally legal, and so NIH, which is you know a mile down the street from my office, can't study it yet. So to be continued, but I do think that there, that it can actually start treating some stuff. But for right now, the only thing that I can say with certainty is it does help symptoms quite a lot. Okay, so sort of I'm going to roll a double question in because two people had uh, questions, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, marijuana, its use for inflation, um, inflammation, and then mm -hmm. also, you know, is there any, you know, early reported benefits for folks with memory loss, Alzheimer's, dementias? Yeah, so, um, okay, so the first question, so, so of, of, so CBD is sort of the anti-inflammatory cannabinoid. So CBD at high doses can have some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and so, you know, so for arthritis, for example, so you can use, you know, if the pain is really bad, you want something with, with THC, but if you're trying to overall decrease inflammation, CBD is very good. As far as things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, again, 
it's too preliminary. So most of the research is on animals and test tubes and things like that, suggesting that um, the cannabinoids have what are called neuroprotective effects, meaning they protect nerve cells, they protect brain cells. So it is possible uh, that you know either cannabis or CBD by itself may be useful in, in those situations. We just don't have, it, but again, we're talking test tubes and, and rats, not too much research is yet to be done on people because of the legal issue. So okay. probably, possibly, maybe, we'll see. But so for right now, it's like, you know, if I have someone going back to Parkinson's, you know, we're gonna treat them for their tremor, but if it has some side benefits of helping the Parkinson's, that would be great. I just can't, you know, gotcha. prove it okay. right now. Fair enough. So last question, um, any insurance that is covering the cost of marijuana? I know Medicare probably isn't because it's federal, but. Um, so there, there's, there's three costs. Uh, the, the best way to think about it, there's three costs. There's the cost of the, the registration, there's the cost of the medical certification, and then there's the cost of the product. Uh, in general, none of those are covered by insurance. So when you go onto the Maryland website to pay to register for and get your card, that cost is not covered by insurance. The product itself is not covered by insurance. Not only that, you have to pay cash because of the federal issues. They only accept cash in the dispensary. They will not accept check or credit card or anything like that. So it's a cash pay. And just like insurance doesn't cover vitamins or Tylenol, it's not currently covering cannabis. We'll see if that changes in the future. As far as the medical certification, um, if your personal physician happens to be uh, registered to certify patients and they accept your insurance, then yes, you might be able to get certified by your personal physician without an additional cost. That doesn't generally happen, though. Most of the certified providers are standalone, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, practices that all they do is certify patients. They do not take insurance. For myself, I don't take insurance for my regular patients, so I don't take insurance for the the cannabis patients. I should mention that 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 while most of what I do is a concierge practice. And I do recommend cannabis for my concierge patients. Most of my cannabis patients are not part of my regular practice. They come from, they have other doctors who send them to me, uh, but their doctor doesn't, doesn't certify patients. So you don't have to be part of my concierge practice to get certified. So I do not accept insurance, but I will give patients invoices that they can submit to insurance for reimbursement. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for Medicare, but for most commercial insurances, a lot of my patients will get some, if not all of it back if they submit to insurance for reimbursement. All right. Well, I'm mindful of the time. So again, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Mintz. This was uh, uh, spectacular in its breadth of knowledge. So thank you for, for sharing. Um, I think uh, his, uh, I think your information is on the screen or uh, in the chat. Is that right, Patricia? Oh, there it is. So if anyone is uh, interested in learning more or seeing Dr. Mintz for uh, either his primary practice, if, if it's not full, Dr. Mintz, uh, or the medical piece uh, for marijuana, uh, certainly uh, please give Dr. Mintz a call. And then uh, again, we thank you at Assisting Hands for joining our monthly What's Your Plan? And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all next month. So thank you all very much. And Dr. Mintz, again, thank you so much for your help today. Great. Thanks for having me.